on scene, which is Aziz Kaili from Dr. Aziz Kaili from the company Selka. Aziz has, I don't know, 15, 20 years experience in cell culture technology. Uh, in 2005, Aziz founded his own company, Selka, that is providing cell line development and process development services. He, before funding that company, Aziz has been working with Beringer Ingelheim in southern Germany in upstream development and uh, also Roche before then. And Aziz will now talk us through biological results uh, of our single-use bioreactors. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here in this nice city, an excellent building. I really enjoy it. Um, thank you, Christelle, for this opportunity to present the data of our company. Um, the previous speaker has given data about engineering aspects of single-use bioreactors. I will speak about the application of the bioreactors. With other words, do the bioreactor do what it's supposed to do? Um, we are a cell line development company and um, upstream process de development company, and we had high titer processes. We have applied these processes with single-use bioreactors, and I am going to present the data. Now, the goal is to produce material in large scale. And as soon as we speak about large scale, we are faced with scalability and scale up. Um, I would like to start with a case study to my talk. Imagine we have a multi-purpose facility. Our colleagues have developed a small-scale process in five-liter bioreactors, and we transfer the process to GMP facility to 1,000 liter. And we run the process. There is no problem. The titer and the cell growth behavior is comparable with small-scale. That's fine. Three months later, our colleagues from small-scale development, they transfer the second process. And we make the scale up with the same machines, with the same people. That goes also well. Titer, cell growth, everything is comparable. Fine. Three months later, we transfer the third process. And we recognize that the titer is lower than in small-scale. And we have a scalability issue. And then, because we all have time pressure, we start discussing. Some people say, OK, you have to increase this stress speed. The other people say, cell line is fragile. And there are so many ideas. And this scale up troubleshooting can take months. Therefore, it is very important to categorize these ideas, how to avoid a scale up problem. I have categorized so that we have first group of parameters, which are engineering parameters. There is a second group of parameter, which is then process-related parameter. There were two questions in this workshop. One of them is, in wave bioreactors, somehow cells don't grow so well, like in, I don't know, small glass bioreactors. And that is a typical case of scalability. There was another question saying, what about with downscale model? Do you have a downscale model for your single-use bioreactor? Now, when you think this situation of Selka, we, we, we should never ask this question. Why? Because we develop a cell line and process and transfer it worldwide. The process must work everywhere in every bioreactor. Therefore, our philosophy is to focus on the process-related parameters. I believe today the most of the scale-up problems are related to the process, not to the engineering parameters of the hardware. According to this philosophy, in the last six years, we have developed a platform technology and applied that also in these single-use bioreactors. Now, the process, a model process, which is developed, is in five liter. 
and we have transferred it to 50 liter and 200 liter single use bioreactors of Sartorius. Why did we choose the Sartorius bioreactors actually? The reason is to stay in the same system, steer tank, steer tank, steer tank. Imagine we transfer the process somewhere, client produces material for, for phase one and two, at phase three, they would like to go to stainless steel bioreactor. If we stay in steer tank, steer tank, steer tank, I believe we would avoid maybe a couple of questions of the authorities. That is simply risk reduction philosophy. Now, I am going to show data from there to there. We have developed antibody processes first, and very normal fat batch, which is inoculated with three times 10 to five cells per mil. The second variant of the process is highly inoculated with high cell concentration, seven times 10 to, five, uh, 10 to six cells per mil. And our goal was to test with these extreme values if the bioreactors really perform well. Now I am starting with classical, Fat batch. The fat batch was developed in shake flask. The red lines are three representing shake flask runs. And here we see the cell growth of three different shake flask, or cell growth in shake flask. After developing the process, we have transferred it to five liter glass bioreactor, stir tank. And the green lines represent the five liter steer tank bioreactor. <laughs> now we need a break. Okay. Um, three green lines represent the five liter glass bioreactor. Later we have transferred the process to 50 liter single use bioreactor of Sartorius. That is the blue line. And thereafter we have run a 200 liter single use bioreactor from Sartorius. And I would say the cell growth is quite comparable. And it is also here notable and very important. We have very high cell concentration in a scalable, simple fat batch. That was the intention. My intention was to run uh, the bioreactors with a challenging process. Challenging means in terms of oxygen demand. Um, regarding viability, again, the colors represent always the same. And uh, here maybe in five liter glass bioreactors, we have a bit higher viability, but I am not sure if it is significant. The glucose profile in five liter bioreactors, the green lines, blue line is 50 liter and 200 liter bioreactor are comparable. The glucose profile of shake flask is not comparable. That was an intention because in shake flask, we normally apply lower glucose concentration. That is visible here. And these five liter bioreactor had the same glucose concentration like the shake flask. What about with lactite profile? Cells produce maybe up to one po uh, up to one gram per liter lactate and then consume and in the end we don't have uh, lactate. Shake flask seem to have a bit higher lactate but that is uh, not the real value because when we take the sample from shake flask until we measure the lactate it, it goes around one hour and that time the cells produce in tube a bit lactate. Um, in terms of product concentration we get around seven gram per liter. It really doesn't matter in which system the cells are cultured. Um, important here is also to mention that the process time is quite long, 17 days. That is the reason for the second group of experiments. That means here we had 
classical fat patch with low inoculation cell density, and what would happen if we inoculate with high number of cells and reduce the process time, and how does it work? Um, here, again, the green lines are five liter bioreactors, blue line is 50 liter, and red line is 200 liter single-use bioreactor. As you can see, we have inoculated with high cell number. We get a very high peak cell concentration, and we have shorter process time of 14 days. Um, I would say all systems are comparable in terms of viable cell concentration. In terms of cell viability, also they are quite comparable. And the product concentration between the system, it really doesn't matter. We get between 9 and 10 gram per liter in a shorter process time. The glucose concentration is, as you see, comparable. And uh, we don't do any glucose limitation, which is very important for scalable processes, for simple processes. And despite that, we get very low lactate concentration, same profile like by first process variant. Um, maybe it's also important to notice here, it is an IgG1 antibody in both cases. We have used the same clone and designed two different processes. And here we have offline pH value. Online values look even better. First of all, there is not big difference between the system. And secondly, and most importantly for me, which is a unique uh, issue of, of our platform technology, the, in all of our processes, we never add any base to control the pH. We adjust the feed, basal medium, and clone to each other so that the remaining pH in the process remains always in the target. How do we do it? As you see here, the cells don't produce acid. The acid is responsible for pH drop. If there is no acid, then there is no demand for adding base. And therefore, we get such behavior. So that was my last slide. Uh, maybe two sentences also about our company. Uh, we are located in Germany, in southern part of Germany. Uh, we have developed a platform technology from vector up to scale up. Um, we offer cell line development and process development. If you are interested, please contact me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aziz. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience to Aziz? Olga Heine Novartis. I have a question concerning your high cell density process. Can you comment on the length of the seed train? Because this must be much longer than for the other process. Um, the, the process variant B, where we have inoculated with high cell concentration, right? Um, this process has to be also scalable, which is very important. Normally, some companies do in N minus one step perfusion in order to increase the cell concentration so that with high cell concentration you can inoculate your production stage. That is normal way. However, I am not convinced about perfusion. It is too complicated. Therefore, we run also fat batch in N minus one step that takes from inoculation until transfer of the cells to the production stage seven days. And what is the N minus one for the other stage, for the other process? It is uh, uh, inoculated with very normal cell concentration, three times 10 to five cells per mil, three days. So then in total your process is as long as the other process? Yes, in terms of facility output, if you consider facility output, then this highly inoculated process is more beneficial because while you are running your production stage, your N minus one stage is empty. You can run it and prepare for the second run. Very nice data. Especially I'm amazed about this very high cell density in your shake flask culture. Can you tell the secret? 
Sorry? What? You have 25 million cells in shake flask culture. Do you have a secret? Do you have oh, any there is secret? no secret. That is an, uh, you know, that is an um, combination of shaking rate, shake flask total volume, and working volume. That are three parameters. You have to find an optimum where you don't get oxygen limitation. An der Hörer University of Applied Science in Biberach, why does your cells don't make lactate? Also, you have so high um, glucose concentrations. Uh, normally, you have a metabolic shift at low glucose concentrations, and then the cells don't make lactate, but you have high uh, glucose concentrations. Why does that work? Yeah, very, very nice uh, uh, question. Uh, when you go to literature, you find at least 50 papers about glucose limitation and lactate consumption. That is the common idea. In order to suppress the lactate formation, you have to limit glucose. But that is not the case. And the data shows lactate formation can be uh, inhibited if you balance your amino acids and other components in your medium. That mm -hmm. is not necessarily only directly related to glucose concentration. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Aziz, again for your talk. And in the interest of time, I would like to move on. However, uh, if you want to discuss more with Aziz, I'm sure that Aziz will be around on the meeting to go into more detail on this uh, interesting metabolic questions.